three questions. And we've got like an hour and 15. Is it okay if we start off? Yeah, we can start. Yeah. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Dean. I work at Status. I'm a security researcher. I used to do the entire auditing thing. I haven't done it in a year, so it's going to be super interesting to see how this space has progressed. And I have a really competent panel. So I think it's probably best if everyone just goes around and introduces themselves, maybe says what they're working on and what some of the most interesting things that have happened in the past year in the security space have been. Uh, maybe events, encounters, changes, things which have progressed in the right direction, or things which we're still seeing which we didn't expect we'd see one year on. Um, hey guys. <laughs> um. Uh, my name is Gonzalo. Uh, I'm here representing the Consensus Diligence team. We're part of Consensus, but we're also uh, squashing bugs. We've been squashing bugs for the past uh, three years, I guess. Um, I'd like to say that a lot has progressed, but we were just talking outside about how it kind of has not. I think it's I think it's <laughs> I think it's normal for stuff to progress slowly, even as like. We mature as the ecosystem matures. Um, things will start progressing, but still slowly, right? Uh, I'm here to talk about it. I'll, I'll let everyone I'm uh, Martin Mostanda, and I work for the Ethereum Foundation with the security stuff regarding Ethereum. And uh, not so much smart contract development through auditing, but more the entire ecosystem. Um, the entire infrastructure of Ethereum. And so last DEFCON, I thought the big change in the security scene was that the security awareness and the entire security uh, community around Ethereum had really started to grow. There's been this e-security uh, group, uh, which is really <coughs> become large and there have been a lot of new new companies formed uh, that were building new cool tools for analysis of smart contracts. And this last year the evolution has kind of continued on that path and the tooling have been uh, become better. And there is more tooling. And I think that the maybe the biggest change in the last year is that all these security folks who started come into the scene through smart contracts, they have now also started looking into the um, the base layer and looking into actually how the EVM works, how the protocol works, and they've given inputs to uh, hard forks and the uh, potential changes in the EVM and things like that. So uh, that's a good development, I think. And I welcome. Hi, I'm Yohei, I work for Quantstan, um, I'm based in Tokyo, I work mainly on audits and also kind of blockchain security uh, consulting for more enterprise focused solutions. Um, over the last year, I think the manual audit process hasn't changed that much, uh, the tools are getting better, um, but it, there's, that's still kind of a bottleneck to how we can kind of transition from like manual audits to fully automated, which I don't think it's going to happen for a couple of years, or maybe a couple of decades. Um, it's just a very hard question. Um, in terms of like the stuff we've seen this year, I think a lot of stuff related to, to gas costs. Um, obviously, there was the constant of coal fat, the hard fork, which was kind of uh, delayed because of some changes um, related to kind of uh, gas pricing. Um, there's been a lot of uh, stuff that we've learned as a company, um, one thing that we're kind of focusing on is how we kind of mitigate uh, risks even after they happen. So as a security company, we're aware that nothing's perfect and all our clients, everyone should be aware that even if you get a security audit, audit nothing's going to be perfect. Um, so people are, I guess, becoming more aware of that and like trying to plan for what happens if actually an unknown vulnerability comes up or a new vulnerability comes up. Um, we've been kind of fixing our uh, and kind of rethinking through our audit process as well and how to, to kind of learn from our mistakes. So I think that's been kind of a good trend. Um, there's been a couple of uh, pretty big security vulnerability findings um, in this space this year. 
uh, things to, to kind of like the insecurity groups. Uh, and I think just as an industry in general, we're kind of being uh, more proactive and kind of uh, responding more rapidly to kind of these uh, vulnerability findings. And I think that's that's good and we'll continue to progress. Hi, I'm Aleko. I'm with Open Zeppelin. Uh, we do uh, the dev tools. Many people know us uh, for uh, the contracts, and we also do security audits. I'm with the security uh, research team. And yeah, I agree on the, on the tools thing. I think there's been a move for a push for more automated tools, and, and this has been developed a lot recently. I also think that there's a bit of over reliance sometimes in, in tools, and with what you just said that. It's going to be a long time still <coughs> to rely on them fully. Uh, one other thing maybe that we saw is a move not only to uh, like a lower level, but also to a higher level, like incentives and, uh, for instance, we had the compound audit this year, which like, created a lot of controversy because we found that like, actually they could like, withdraw the entire money. So there was the question, like, should we like, report these kind of things? Often, often times we work with like no clear threat models, so it's, you have to like, be conservative, conservative about the threat model and like, in what we report or, or don't. So I think it's, uh, and sometimes the, like, the clients don't want us to look at the, the incentive systems for some reason, but we think it's super important, and so we do it uh, anyway. So I think that's an interesting direction in which it, it has developed a little, and we're going to see a lot of development. Right. Hi, uh, my name is Hubert. I work for JSC Security Group. I'm also doing audits and as Martin said, uh, been looking a bit more into low level security also this year. And yeah, I totally agree with your last point that you just mentioned, so I'm going to pick it up there. So we also see a lot of fights with people over trust models, uh, 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 clients and on trust models and so on. So um, like that's, that's always a place where, where there's tension because the client never thinks of themselves as malicious. So. Um, that's, but that's of course what decentralized uh, can bring to us, so that, um, that's very interesting. Otherwise, uh, in general, in terms of the year, I would say it's been an interesting year. I would say um, last year, DevCon Open Zeppelin released or, uh, or really announced uh, Zeppelin OS, and I think we've really felt the impact. We are seeing a lot more delegate calls than we were seeing one year ago uh, due to all of the proxies and so on. So. Um, that definitely has happened, and still, of course, we're seeing a lot of bugs, but I think we're seeing bugs on a different level now. Um, at uh, the Lightning Talks, there was like an interesting graph how like, now the average call depth of contracts has gone up a lot. Like we're seeing contracts that have like call depths up to 10 deep or something, like some contract that calls Kyber Network, then later the calls uh, Compound and so on. Like the complexity is going up a lot. So I think security has generally gone up, but because complexity has also gone up, kind of there's still still sufficiently many bugs. So like I would say generally it's it's, it's been positive here. Yeah, so with the whole call depth thing that you mentioned, I think what 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 we realized there is that um, a year ago a lot of us were mainly auditing ICO contracts and token contracts, and now people are actually building those products and I think some of you here have probably retained some of the people in the ICOs that uh, you were auditing and are now actually auditing the products which they're shipping. Um, do you think that they've learned from the things you were teaching them a year ago and the uh, general maturity of their code bases is uh, going up or do you think we're still making the same mistakes? Uh, yeah, I can quickly start. I definitely uh, think that they've learned. Um, yeah, so um, I think that I mean, for example, thanks to the great work by Open Zeppelin, that a certain standard has been set, and like uh, it's become a lot easier to write good code. And there's kind of like the, there has been like kind of a, a template for good code now, um, and that, that's why I think in general it has improved. Yeah, I agree. And, and just to add to that, for instance, we put up a, like a, a, a guide to. Uh, checklist for what to ex what to ex what we expect from the code before starting an audit. To like that. And I think this has worked, and so we typically see uh, code in in a uh, you know, much more mature stage than we used to see before. So what are some of the things you throw on the checklist? What do you what do you expect from your clients? Documentation. We, we put a lot of emphasis in documentation testing, like 
things that like talk about the health of the of the code, for instance. And uh, we had the Solidity uh, compiler audit last year, and a lot of the issues we found were like like the bus factor. There were two people working on like a language. You know, the, the bus factor is like a factor, or like if the, how many people have to be in a in a bus that crashes for the like, project to end entirely. And it was like two guys running like this whole industry essentially. So so and, and so these kind of things we now um, have in in this checklist, and, and I think the projects are doing like a much better job. Those. I think the bus factor is probably something interesting for you as well, from like what things that happened in Shanghai when everyone was on the same flight and no one was able to respond to things. As the EF kind of like developed new strategies to ensure that if things are found on mainnet, there is always someone who's able to respond, or is, are we still in a two man, three man point of failure there? So we're in a There is no like structured way that it's ensured that there are always people on board, but a lot of the, uh, I mean EF is pretty spread out and core developers are pretty spread out, but if an earthquake was to take out Europe, then yeah, it would be probably pretty bad for the neighbors. But there are still some people in the USA who can help out. There are problems <laughs> on the mainnet Okay. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit to the maturity uh, topic. Um, I, we've seen uh, people write uh, better code, people sheet products that we audit their, I, their ICOs uh, before or not. Um, and I think it's also due to the bear market, to be honest. Like, everybody was, you know, like, there was a clear lull. Like, nothing was happening, and people were actually building. I don't like it was a meme, but it was also true. Like people were building products, they were, and now they're shipping those products, and we see maturity. We see like bigger call that um, that that shows in the code quality that reaches us as a company. The audits that we that we uh, the clients that we engage with, like they have good teams, and like, and, like that shows in the code quality. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. I kind of want to talk about templating. Obviously, uh, OpenSafe and all the work around templating. Um, is, is, has been a major contribution, and I think it's a great path to continue down. Um, at the same time, as the contracts become more complex, there are these custom, uh, there's, there's these features that become more general that people want to use, but might not be available on OpenZeppelin. Um, so at the same time, we've been seeing a lot more like, copy and pastes of these very complex functions. Um, and then when a vulnerability is found in one of these, and you just find these across different contracts. So being able to kind of maybe, I don't know, submit these kind of complex contracts for more audits to happen, and kind of turning them into templates might be one way to move forward, but um, I mean, it, it sucks that the, the first company to actually develop it has to kind of carry on the burden of paying for the auditing, um, and the people who yeah. just copy it are basically free writers. A lot of people like to use templates but not yeah. contribute in any way to it. Yeah, not just templates but like other people's code, right? Because yeah. smart contracts are kind of open source, so people just take what's good and what's working and then they don't have to pay for, for the security afterwards. So, I mean, that's, that's a challenging problem to solve, kind of distributing the costs um, across the first person to market and everyone who just copies their code. Um, but that might be something to kind of think about going forward. Okay, so now that we've kind of moved away, as I said, from ICOs, um, from auditing simple token contracts to more complex systems, um, how has that affected your practices? Are you guys finding yourself using tools more uh, in addition to doing manual audits? Are you focusing more on doing manual audits? Or um, what's, what's changed in your workflow over the past year due to the changes we're seeing? I think... Uh Having like a, a solid understanding of the business model and what they're trying to achieve has been a crucial part of the audit process. Um, just understanding the business logic and uh, figuring out how that's translated into code has uh, obviously it has consumed a lot more of our time. Um, if it's like a simple token contract or an IEO ICO contract, then um, it's fairly straightforward what kind of features are uh, available. 
like once the contracts start talking to other contracts and other projects, then it becomes a lot more harder to kind of map out what does what. Um, and that scope gets a lot bigger. So I think in terms of the stuff we did last year and now, um, the kind of the on-ramping of the project has consumed a lot more time than it, it did last year. I can, I can touch on a topic but that uh, uh, we were asking uh, Martin before and say that we, like I personally found out that we were, uh, that we were or that we were not that prepared to for instant response, honestly. like. As people have shipped more products, more stuff has happened like in real time, right? Like there's a lot more and the, 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 the groups that were in, the security groups that were in, like the like people are always discovering stuff. And like incident response has become more and more important. And um, I've honestly found out that we're not that great at it. Yeah. And that we need really, really, really fucking needed to step up our game. I think for you guys, we're also in the F security chat. Uh, we've noticed that there's people now like, shout out to Sam, whoever he is, fucking <laughs> finding bugs every three oh, days yeah. in like major yeah. protocols. If he's here, like, you're amazing. I don't know how you do it. You need to sleep a little more. But um, I, I guess with the incident response, we, we can learn from two companies here who've, who've done audits and all of us miss things sometimes for zero X, uh, for uh, consensus diligence, it was the zero X audit. And for chain security, it was DAO stack, where both of them, I don't remember the DAO stack vulnerability. The consensus diligence one missed a, um, a return size check in the zero X contracts. Thankfully, none of the trades were affected, but um, what, when, when things like these are discovered, what what have you learned from that? Uh, how has that affected your practices? Um, what will you do further on to try and like minimize that? Um, yeah, so that's also a very good and comfortable question. Uh, <laughs> we 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 learned something, so that's good. Um, and, and mostly it was processes, right? It's not like Sam is probably a, 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 an AI. I don't know. I don't know how we. <laughs> uh, he, he just does everything. That's good. That's good that he's a good guy and not just exploiting everything for bad. Uh, but internally, we discovered that we needed to, like, again, we needed to up, up our game like in processes, right? Process-wise, in, in mainly in a very specific part of an audit, which is mitigations, right? So what happened, like for this people that, that don't quite know, like the, in the static call, it was like a problem with the, with the call data return. And we discovered that what happened was that we were not treating the mitigation space beat like the part after the audit, after we uh, after we provide a report, after we um, provide the artifact to the client, they obviously fix the flaws, right? That we find the vulnerabilities. Now we were probably not treating this mitigation space as as a new audit, which it should be, because like it's new code, so it's so it's a completely different thing that you gotta that you gotta um, check, I guess. And, uh, and, and so it's a new audit. It's just not fixed it, right? It's not. It's not like new code is new code. That's it. So that's mostly the, the most important thing that came out of that. What, that we learned internally is that new code is new code. There's no two different ways to treat it. There's no mitigation. There's not. You cannot uh, care less just because it's it's after um, the, the audit that, that comes after the audit has finished, basically. So we, 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 we are now just realizing that um, we are, uh, like we all collectively have been capable of just like, um, to, like share these uh, teachings and, and learnings honestly. So um, we've learned a lot from all the other guys in the room as well. So there's been quite a lot of incident response uh, during the last three years for my part and kind of what I can say about those is that they've all been kind of different and they can't really, we can't apply a template. Okay, so we have an incident, we do gather in this channel and communicate with these people because they're all can vary so widely. Like for example, if we did discover that there's a vulnerability in the Solidity compiler, then that's kind of highly privileged information and first a couple of core people need to find out exactly how what triggers this bug to appear, and can we scan the, the entire all the, uh, all the contract and see what are affected, and how bad is it? Can we actually exploit that? And can we reach out to them? Pro tip, by the way, 
it's really good idea to put some kind of contact information in your uh, verified source code. Um, and, and then we have these other kind of instances where, yeah, there's one built in get, so which is just get team, or there's a like parity have number of wallets which anyone can take claim ownership on, where there actually needs to be a group of people who are willing to basically exploit these, which can be seen as kind of invasive. Uh, but and, and, and in that part, uh, this white hat group has done a lot of good for the community in general. Uh, yeah, the uh, question was also directed at us. Um, yeah, so a very good question. So for us, it actually was what what, I, what was mentioned before: trust model. Um, so the trust model wasn't entirely clear. It wasn't clear which. Which contract can call which contract? Whether that contract can be replaced with an untrusted contract, and that's that's then what caused it. And um, so yeah, as already well explained, it, it's definitely a, a matter of processes, making sure that trust model is clear, making sure the documentation is clear, making sure the business model is very clear. Which contract can be replaced with untrusted code? Which contracts cannot be replaced with untrusted code? And then um, yeah, it was a very yeah, very subtle bug in the end, but of course, uh, as, as with every bug, when you see it, then you're like, God damn, how could we have missed this? But um, yeah, just two repetitive uh, calls to a getter, which then, uh, which is a constant, but then of course you can you can build it as not a constant anymore, and then uh, everything uh, breaks. Yeah, I think a, a general lesson too is. Uh, uh, we are all auditors. We will all miss bugs eventually. So what what an audit uh, means, right? We, like an audit is not a guarantee of security, but just like an assessment of security. Uh, and we we all miss bugs eventually. Uh, and yeah, so I think this is a, an important message too. That it's, it's important that uh, these things are are visible, that we acknowledge them when they happen. And so, so that people know what to expect from an audit and not think that they're absolutely safe because they've carried out a security audit. And coming back also to your previous question, um, I think to the uh, on, on the uh, what the uh, the things uh, we look at and the threat model. Um, I was going to say something, but I forgot. So. No worries. So. Speaking about how audits aren't actually a guarantee of security, um, it might be interesting to hear from you guys, what is an audit actually, and who are they written for, right? So, with crypto, it's kind of, in, or with this industry which we're working it's kind of interesting, where we open source a lot of our audits, and I feel like Martin, coming from a more traditional thing before Ethereum, how did that work there, what's different here, um, and do you think those differences are good for the user, or does it not even matter? Like, should users have to care about a company having gotten an audit? Is it really that important? Um, who who who's really the client of one of these audits, right? Yeah, and I think it ties into to what you guys were talking about earlier. So, to give some context. Uh, uh, from the like regular security industry, it's very clear who is the customer and who orders the audit. It's the, the company that wants to be audited, and typically you, you go in and you do a security audit, and it's highly classified, and you deliver it to the customer, and the customer uh, there might be probably only like five people who read it, um, and they probably don't spread it internally because they kind of want to forget all about it. But they want to fix it, uh, and then later on you confirm that it was fixed. And it's no one would ever dream of like publishing it. And then, then in this open source uh, world, it's kind of expected that these audit results are published, and uh, in some cases there is even kind of an expectation that the audit should be phrased in a way that really. Uh, um, describes how good this thing is. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't done audits uh, for the last couple of years, but 
I mean, in smart contracts. But before that, I noticed several customers were like wanted to to pick out some snippets of, of where of the audit where it was really positive words, and that's not how I ever wrote the audits. I was put into the audit that this only highlights all the bad stuff and doesn't even mention the I've, I've had that experience where I've written an audit and people came back to me to say that uh, they were sad about the audit result because it didn't highlight the things which they did good. So <laughs> <laughs> um, right. it was like, I, I don't care about what you did good, I care about what you did bad and that's the only thing you paid me to highlight. I'm not going to give you two thumbs up on like, wow, your, your C20 was really beautifully written. <laughs> exactly. So, so I think, and I think that that's a good thing if it comes into to, uh, smart contracts, to even to the open source world, that audits, they're not like pats on the back saying you did good. It highlights, you suck here and here and here. Yeah. And that's it. Um, yeah, I forgot what the question was really. Uh, do you want to take a question? Yeah, that works. Take a question right now. So, uh, I have a question. So, how do you guys identify the uh, vulnerability? So, uh, how you can make decision that this piece of logic is definitely bug, the security bug, and this is not? Yeah, I guess uh, the question was how we identify the vulnerability. Um, I would phrase it quite uh, concisely. I mean, as uh, has been said in the beginning, you need a specification, and if it mismatches the specification, it's a bug. Probably also a lot of experience, right? I think a lot of us have looked at code over excessive amounts of hours, and at one point you start to get a feel for which lines start to look dingy, and then you start analyzing those lines, and then at one point you're like, yes, this is definitely dingy. But it's it's probably for most of us, it's a multi or multi-stage process. Um, it's definitely about expectations, right? The, the mismatch of expectations. If you provide us a specification, then we will try to match the code to that specification. So, like, where it, like it's about expectations, but like your expectations. If you don't provide us with a specification, we will have to come up with one ourselves, right? And this is what, what Dean was talking about. We look at code a lot, so we try to, like, mainly just like we try to come up with a specification that we think you want. But that might not exactly be what you want. So yeah, just write your specifications so we know what to check for. Otherwise, it's really, really hard for us to do the job that you want us to do. By specification, you mean the white paper? I need mean documentation of any sorts. So, so, yeah, I will say, I mean, so there's, from one part, there's this high level thing where you have like these specifications, uh, maybe written in like a, a flow or a business use case kind of thing, but then what Dean was referring to, I, I think, is more like the lower level assumption. You can look at just a snippet of code and see what are the assumptions being made here. Here's an assumption that this value will not be negative, uh, and here's an assumption that this loop will end on before a certain time. So, I'm asking because I also do security audits, and uh, sometimes it happens that uh, the smart contract is uh, without any bugs, so it's uh, beautiful, it's written very good quality code, but it works different than something that described in the white paper. Yeah, so is this a bug or not? Yes, so here's how my process used to work when I was still auditing. What I would do is I would expect a specification from my client, and then I would go off and look at the code and write a specification for myself. And then while looking at that code, I look at like general bugs and everything and I write my specification and then I compare it to the specification which they've handed me. And I, I, I try to analyze, um, do, do the behaviors which I have found interact with what they've given me? And the reason why I, I write my own specification before reading theirs is because I don't want to cloud my judgment by their, by their predefined assumptions. So I, I go in completely blindly, I do that, I look at that, I compare, and then I go off of that and I continue off of that. So I think for everyone it's probably a multi-phase process which starts off by just, first it's the quick scan for like the stupid bugs, like stupid calculation, re-entrancy, stuff like that, and then you continue, you, go for, you always go one layer further.
Yeah, and just to quickly follow up, I think that really ties into your question before, who's the audience of the audit? Um, because actually what we started to do in this whole ICO hype that you mentioned when we started doing a lot of audits was we always clearly wrote what the token does or what the ICO does. Like for example, how many percent of the tokens does the creator get? Because that was sometimes not so clear on the website, let's say. And we found this was really important for the people and also if we don't write it in the report, even though it might clearly be said on the website now, it might not be on the website anymore tomorrow. And then people will say like, oh, but you said this is correct as is. And then, um, so we found it's important to document certain core features because to us, um, the general public is also like a, an audience of, of the audit report. I think the stuff, uh, every, I agree with everyone, what everyone said, but um, one thing that I think auditors talk about is the, the centralization issue and how sometimes it's not documented in the white paper, um, and if that's something we should highlight on, on these reports. Obviously, I think the, the reports are kind of targeted towards the community in some way, um, but not. It's, it's very technical, so it's very hard for someone who doesn't understand solidity to kind of go through the report and see how good the code is. Obviously, we're, we're pointing out where the mistakes are, so it is going to sound pretty negative, but it doesn't mean that um, the code's absolutely trash, right? There are, like, even good projects have, have vulnerabilities that might have been addressed, too. And we phrase it that way, so there was not there was a vulnerability, we fixed it, but readers might think that, oh, if it had a vulnerability in the first place, it might not be good code. So kind of managing expectations is kind of also important. Um, we try to do that, we try to make it fair, so, um, so we point out the mistakes, but we also address um, how they fixed it. And obviously kind of like the centralization and also kind of um, upgradability. So the thing with smart contracts is that it's not supposed to be upgradable, um, but there are ways to kind of implement upgradability. So in that case, the code might be safe for now when the audit was uh, conducted, but we can't actually guarantee that in the future. So uh, we tend to kind of talk about that in the reports and um, kind of work with the clients to figure out how to phrase that and what they expect and how they can uh, mitigate vulnerabilities that might come across from these upgradability and centralization issues. One thing we started doing recently, and actually in consensus they were doing it before us, and we really like is uh, make a summary post, uh, aside from the full report, which is less technical, and containing like a summary of how the project works, and, and things about the threat model we either have like, provided by the client or we assume, and, and a summary of the main vulnerabilities we found and then link to the actual report where that's it technical. So that's a much more digestible thing and yeah, thanks guys for coming up with that because I, yeah, I think that's that's very useful and it's a good way to inform the community without like you know, having like a technical high bar of reading a full audit report. Yeah, in regard to your question earlier, which I forgot to actually answer. So I think it, it belongs to good form and should be included in the security audit is basically the uh, trust assumptions of a contract. So there is an admin who can do whatever he wants. And there are these kinds of admins which can do these kinds of actions. So if the report is published, then that should be published with it. Um, yeah, because it, it should be communicated to the community. And I think it is uh, the responsibility of the auditors to, to outline the trust model. I, I, I do have a question for you guys. So, um, well, when you when you uh, talk about that, the trust model, do you highlight that even the specification of the client says that that's what he wants, right? Do you do you do you feel that there is a, like an ethical obligation? To auditors somehow is that is that like what you guys are uh, where we are arriving at? Is there like an ethical obligation to flag that even if it's the specification that's the way they want it? Uh, yes, I think so because it also um, yeah highlights that this is how it works and these are the the built-in trusts in this contract. I think there's a question over there in the comments. 
Yeah. Uh, so just want to go back to the uh, a bit the public uh, reporting. So, and it might sound a bit cynical, but there's I think an incentive to uh, disclose every bug, obviously, on on behalf of the auditor. Uh, especially since these are these reports are typically you know good PR. They found a lot of bugs, and they're very severe. So, do you think that there, there's an incentive to uh, exaggerate the severity of the bug or maybe explain it in a way uh, in the report that makes it seem like it was more difficult to find or anything and also if that incident does exist how do you uh, manage your relationship with clients so they don't perceive it uh, so they don't perceive this I think the easiest method is not having any marketing people on the team <laughs> making sure that the reports were written by technical people um, yeah, but actually, that's not a new problem. This is the same thing from, from classic security. And what typically happens is that you deliver a report, you have a communication with the client, and they say, hey, that's not really high because there's only like uh, uh, blah blah. There's only, you can only access the uh, something that's not important. And then you can say, oh, okay, oh, never mind. then we'll put it down to medium and stuff. So this is, and then you deliver a final report. Um, that's usually what happens. But those reports weren't public, right, in the classic world? No, they classically aren't public. Right. But I mean, I mean it's basically the same back and forth. You agree with your clients, uh, and at the end of the day, it's up to the auditors to deliver a report. Um, and it's up to the client to decide, do we want to publish this or not? And if we publish it, we can make no changes to it, but we can say, hey, we think that the report actually sucks because we don't think it's that bad. Yeah, and going back to the kind of the, the severity classification, um, we try to be as objective as possible. Um, like if someone else who wasn't involved in the audit process looks at it, how severe would they think it is? So we do have, I think every company has kind of uh, standards on what they classify as high, uh, medium, low, uh, informational. Um, at the end of the day, it kind of depends on how much impact uh, it might have on the end user, the people who use the smart contracts. So if there's going to be significant financial loss, and obviously it's high severity. Uh, but again, we do work with uh, the clients to figure out if this bug were to be exploited, what would be the impact, um, and how how easy it would be to, to kind of exploit it. Not um, we don't take it into account like how hard it was for us to discover it. Um, I think it's more about the impact and what happens to the users. Um, so it, it is a battle. Um, we do uh, upgrading and kind of downgrading severities um, during the audit process is is common, and um, it really we try to be as objective as possible. Where are the mics? I think there's a question here. I, yeah. I think I can. My voice carries. Go ahead. Um, two, two quick questions. One is uh, it's, it's around the tooling, um, uh, and um, in relation to that, with like um, vulnerabilities that appear only when the contract has been running for a long time. So, so um, what 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 type of tooling? You know, it's like like with X and diligence. What other tools are, are you guys using for for the um, security analysis? On the one hand, and then the the second question is um, around. Um, uh, the crypto economic security analysis, do you actually do that as well? Um, because you know you have behavior in contract that, you know, for example, if you have liveness assumptions around around staking mechanisms, right? Um, you know, do do you and then it's if, if it's not fully specified or there's 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 something that's that's missing, then you can't know that it's actually something that there's that, that there's a bug because they don't check, for example, for block number. I'll say that um, it's also part of like the, the, the conversation with the client, right? Not the tooling part, I love that plug. Yes, Mifax is great, <laughs> your tools are great. Uh, um, there's a lot of great tools in the space, though. Kind of like, uh, I heard that um, EVM is also getting uh, open source this Thursday. Like, that's an example of a, of a very good EVM. Yeah, yeah sorry, I'm not like not the EVM, yeah, but I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Sorry. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of great tools, or, or tools are good. Uh, but yeah, answering the other question about uh, the crypto economics uh, sense about it, 
I think that comes with the dialogue with the client. So normally you'd ask, like, right? You, you can see from their specification what parts they want you to focus on, but that also comes with the dialogue. Like we actually ask the client, wait, what, what do you want us to focus on? Like what, what parts, uh, maybe it's just code, maybe it has nothing to do with the economic part, but maybe they just want us to model the the, the, the economics behind the, their smart contracts, right? It, I, I think it varies a lot, basically. So one interesting aspect about crypto economic security, uh, which I think is largely overlooked, is the fact that transactions uh, float around on the network for a while before they're actually included, and people can make bets against what they see uh, is going to happen. Uh, and, and investigate the transaction pools to know what's going to happen, and of course to uh, you know uh, inject transactions before certain events. Uh, and Phil Diane is giving a talk later today uh, about other bad things that can happen. Like for example, it can be profitable to do to reorganize part of the chain and move around with how. Uh, events played out uh, in a way that even though it, it costs you a lot from the mining perspective, uh, the actual value you can cash out from that attack make it feasible. Um, yeah, I'm curious to hear Phil Dine talk about that later. So I think that kind of plays into the fact that we're now building all these protocols and there's all these externalities that uh, a classic security audit probably doesn't need to look at. You being like one of the main people at EF Security uh, who knows a lot of these things on how the protocol works, do you find yourself uh, getting more questions from people building things on top of it? Or do you think you'd like more interaction with people building things on top of the EVM and on top of uh, Ethereum in general to come and ask about these externalities to kind of learn about all the things that can go wrong outside of just the isolated smart contract? Um, yes, I, I definitely think that, I mean, as I said earlier, a lot of the security folks who came into the space to, to study smart contracts have gradually turned their eyes towards the, the rest of the infrastructure, and that's really great. Um, I think it would be a good thing if more people, and even that developers and people who wrote smart contracts knew more about the uh, infrastructure as a whole. Yeah, so I think to that, as a plug uh, to anyone working on smart contracts and stuff, there's this great uh, Telegram channel with a bunch of us in it, a bunch of security guys, a bunch of DAP developers called F Security, and it's easy to join, and you can always uh, get opinions from multiple people there, ranging from not just Martin, but Trail of Bits is in there, we're all in there, so to anyone who wants to say, think something looks a little weird, uh, you can usually go in there and ask and someone will be happy to help and explain from top to bottom what could go wrong. So even before an audit you can probably go in there and check that out. Just a question about that, is it is it a good idea to have anyone be able to join? Obviously there are some like, sensitive stuff that are being disclosed there. Say if like a black hacker joins and then just exploits all, all, all the stuff that, that's being talked there. Um, I, I, I'm not sure what the, the best approach is to stuff like that. Yeah, so uh, I think it's already about 200 people in it, so. Yeah, it's, it's all out. Yeah. <laughs> so interestingly, with the, with that entire black hat philosophy, um, Trail of Bits is usually very sensitive on how much of the audit um, they release because they're from a very traditional security standpoint, where where they believe that um, audits shouldn't directly be open sourced. Whereas when I was auditing, I had the philosophy of if a client doesn't want me to open source an audit, I won't even work on it. Um, I think it depends in this space because everyone can look at your stuff already. If there's a bug, someone will have probably already found. It. Especially as we start growing, uh, I believe that it, if there's a bug, someone will have found it already. They may have just not exploited it yet. So if it gets out, it gets out. We've had these sensitive things on like um, on protocol level as well, where there was the Ralston hard fork, 
where we had to uh, very slowly, uh, it was Robston or Rigby, I don't remember. Robston. Yeah, where uh, Parity had enabled a feature that wasn't supposed to be enabled yet, and there was a there was a network split. There was also that problem of how do you start to slowly communicate to all the actors in the network to start updating their nodes so it doesn't happen on live because it was something that could have happened on yeah. live. And I, I don't think there's any way around that. Um, yeah, that person could have easily done it on Robston and then done it on mainnet. Yeah, we just and we didn't know who the who the attacker was. Yeah, made that transaction. Uh, then we actually found out that it was uh, it was some researchers who were trying out some Casper contract things. Yeah, yeah, it was it was totally innocent, but yeah. it could have been something completely different. So I think you you try to keep it silent, but I think the main point is acting as fast as possible. And we, I remember being on that, and that was quite hectic. We acted as fast as possible from contacting my crypto first to update their notes to slowly getting to miners and then getting to exchanges and making sure that you keep things vague enough while you can but just ensure that people are actually doing their stuff that's not like yeah i'll update my note tomorrow i think all the cases we're just talking uh, now are cases where the thing is live so i think it makes a lot of difference if it's live uh, uh, protocol or smart contracts or whatever, or if it's like something to be released, and uh, in that case maybe it's uh, it, it's much easier to uh, publish the report of and like open it up for the community because there's no actual risk yet. So, um, you guys remember what the Joker did in the 1989 Batman movie? His plot was about not tainting any one chemical, but making a series. He was a chemical genius, and he had a bunch of different products that all essentially were safe by themselves, but as they came together, sent you into a neurological death spiral. So, what I think about composability with this model that we're talking about now, audits that happen on an atomic level, and they can pass, but then people are putting together these money Legos and these blocks in such a way that there are vectors that may not have been considered because the use cases weren't anticipated, and right now it seems like there's not Obviously, anybody that's looking at it, you know, at when people are putting these things together in an open source way, and I'm wondering if this is something that concerns you. You see people building on top of audited products and assuming that because they're safe or they're audited in their atomic way, that perhaps they're they're safe in a money like this tower. Yeah, um, I think that's a good question, and that actually comes very very, very much back to trust assumptions, right? Which have been mentioned a couple of times. So I totally agree with what Martin said before. They have to be clearly mentioned in the audit report, right? So and if you see trust assumptions in the audit report, so I've been luckily brought this up this year with the compound audit and like made a really good point there, which I think really helped a lot the whole community. Um, and so you see the trust assumptions. So I think. I, to kind of answer this question on two levels, I think on the on the smart contract level, first of all, if you assume that like it could interact with anything else, then of course compo composability will not always be there, but should be there. And if you clearly document the, tr the trust assumptions, then people can see how it should compose and how it shouldn't. And on the other side, there's also but there's also the low level protocol, which where I also find this interesting. Um, I mean, we now have a uh, half for coming up with six EIPs, right? And then another one with, let's say, six or eight. I, I guess not entirely clear yet, but um, there I find it even more interesting because there you clearly have this composability problem because uh, yeah, now we have cases where one half for uh, where one EIP influences the other, right? Like um, and like by themselves they are fine, but like then you put them both together and they're not so fine anymore. So there. I think because these, these are closer connected, their composability is not so clear. For smart contracts, I generally find it a bit easier to think about composability. You get that in the traditional infosec space as well. A lot of the time, uh, you find attacks on like uh, servers and find backdoors. It's not actually any one software that's uh, a problem. It's like a configuration fuck up between two things uh, that leads to that problem. So I think we all need to get better at <coughs> investigating use cases and uh, testing against those various use cases to try and find those problems. And that's probably one place where tools can definitely help out, where you, it's just, there's a big world out there and we can't uh, look at everything, right?
Yeah, I just wanted to add that this happens at uh, all levels. Like, for instance, in our Open7 contracts, we have like a system of inheritance where you like you know, build the things out of smaller building blocks, and you have like a, a combinatorial explosion of possibilities. And of course, you cannot audit all these possibilities. And there's like, for instance, if you do multiple inheritance, you have the linearization problem. And, and if you do it wrong, you you might have a problem. And so, so this is not only like as systems get more complex, but already in the building blocks, uh, one has to really pay attention to this kind of thing. I'll just say something really, really quick. Um, um, it, we've seen that happen, right? Like with ERC seven seven seven, for example, just recently, we see that like it, 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 that gets like some reentrancy problems, right? Um, and we do that every day. <coughs> I'm sorry guys, um, we do that every day uh, with protocol, right? Using the, pro the protocol is right, and again, like, uh, yeah, just um, to that earlier point about zero x, like, the static call, we assume, like, our trust model assumed that that was okay, and it was not, right? Like, we're, like, completely overseeing the thing that was happening below in the stack. So even composability, even not only about smart contracts, but about, like, the way the protocol plays with those smart contracts, it's, a, it's also, like, it, it, there's a lot of problems there, right? And that's the hard part about our job, I guess. I kind of bring up the, the finance, the financial side as well. Like, if, you, if you're a product building on other products or interacting with other uh, smart contracts and other projects that build, you pro if you're extremely paranoid about security, then you might pay to get all the other things, all the, your dependencies automated as well. But that's probably not going to happen. Like most of the, most projects do want to kind of control costs as well. Uh, so again, um, it, there is kind of this financial limitation as well. I think in some sort of way, um, and that's that's where all the the trust assumptions come in. Like you can't conduct an audit for this part of the code um, based on the trust assumptions um, between other other projects and other uh, contracts. Hi. Uh, two things. First, how valuable are quick informal audits in your estimation? If, if you're in an upgradable world where you're going to be pushing out lots of changes and whatnot, it's somewhat valuable at least to have someone looking over your code, just basically giving it a quick read through. Or do you think that most of the value comes from being able to do a deep dive? And then, bonus question. What would you change about the EDM? Yeah, magic wand. Oh god. <laughs> Throw it away. Um, to the quick audit thing, uh, every code review I've gotten from Nick Johnson or like Martin Holzman has been more valuable than any audit report I've ever received on anything I've built. Um, no offense to any of the guys here because they're all super competent, but uh, a lot of the times, informal, I find informally, um, they also don't care about language and how they talk to me, which I find a lot more useful. Um, like when you're in the business of, of auditing, you have to keep your client happy, otherwise they won't come back to you for a later audit. When I ask someone like Nick for a prod to, to review something, he'll break it in every way possible because he thinks it's fun, um, <laughs> which you can't do in an audit. Like th there's a certain like limit on what what you can do and um, how rude you can be to continue having a client. I was going to say to ask the guys sitting next to you, we just did like a quick audit for them. I don't know, is it useful for you? What do you find? Yeah, I think it's great. But I would say it's the same thing, right? It's, it's getting a second pair of eyes on something that you've made assumptions on. Um, getting a fresh look at it, you get to validate those assumptions. I think an important thing is uh, to be clear about the expectations you get of a quick look. Uh, if you're clear with that, I think it can be very helpful. I think it also differs on the stage that your product is at, right? Like, you might get a lot from a quick and dirty audit, but you, at some point, you should get a, like, a real audit, right? Like, so not one verified, like, a lot of device on your code. Um, at some point, you will. Yeah. Yeah, just to quickly add, I think it can really help at an early stage, especially with the architecture because you can design kind of smart contracts and how they interact in many different ways. And before you build out all the little details, if you kind of design them in like a not, not optimal way, you can actually save yourself a lot of time. And that, that we have had some cases like this where you say early, why don't you do it like this? 
save your, yourself a lot of time and our us a lot of time because it's also going to be a lot easier to order later. So regarding what would change on the EVM, <laughs> just some minor things. So right now, when we do a call and we get a return value, the call fails. Um, that is zero. So error is zero and success is one. And we know from the Unix world that's just wrong. So I mean, zero, that's when it works. And then you have an infinite number of ways it can go wrong. And now we can't change that. We can't have it went out of gas, or no, it didn't go out of gas, it actually reverted, or some new thing, interesting error happened. Uh, we just can't have it. And we can never have it. Unfortunately, because of that final decision long ago. And we should just have a call with value. So maybe to you, um, especially because we're, I think F2.0 is like the big buzz, uh, with things like that, with how the EVM design, uh, do you find yourself talking more closely to the teams working on the ETH 2.0 to ensure that we don't fall into these problems? Like the one thing which I know annoyed me a lot of the time is the way storage works in Ethereum, is that um, it's very mathematically sound and very, like every computer theory book will tell you to build it the way the EVM did it, but in practice it's never actually done like that. Um, and I know Nick Johnson hates this as well, it's the, it's the word size, and that's like something I would change. Um, do, do you find yourself working more closely with teams to ensure that like the protocol follows uh, more of these age-old design philosophies and is more sound in that design? Uh, no, actually. Would you like to? Um, yeah, to some degree. But so, at this point, uh, ETH has these different execution environments. And I think the vision is that one of them will be EWASM based, which is designed already by some other people who are supposed to be smart, and I assume it's good. And rolling in ETH1 means we can't modify ETH1 too much. And I don't think there is an intention to have like a new kind of ETH1 virtual machine in ETH2 where we just, yeah, refactor the first EVM <laughs> again. And I don't think there is a push for that. Be nice if these things weren't so permanent. Um, so, going back into protocol, EIP 1283 delayed Constantinople. I think you guys found that issue. A bunch of us were on the call discussing that on whether we should delay it or not. Um, and EIPs is kind of this like rough thing. Everyone can kind of submit it, and no one seems to review it properly, and no one seems to audit it. How, how do we improve that? How do we ensure that like we don't delay hard forks last minute every time because last minute is then when it's most interesting for everyone to look at? How do we ensure that we, we, we get into this earlier and don't even get so far as to having to be on a call at 2 o'clock in the morning deciding on whether to delay Constantinople or not? So, <clears throat> Hudson mentioned this briefly in his poll. Um, this idea that we should do deep centric forks so that there is, uh, we, we change a bit how the process for EVs could look. Previously, we had that someone submitted an EVE and a couple of people looked at it and said, like, yeah, this is great, this is going into whatever next hard fork is. And we said, yeah, we'll include these five EVs into that hard fork, which is going to happen on June 1st. And then all the work started and problems and problems, and we had to post both the fork. But instead of doing that, the idea is to have the old quarter that says, yeah, these five apes look great, go ahead with these. Uh, don't set a date, don't set a fork number, nothing. And then the uh, work starts, uh, they actually build things, and they get it in, accepted into clients. Uh, once it's been accepted into clients in the form that it can be enabled by testing, or by a genesis switches that makes it possible to, to actually run test cases for it as well. So then they go ahead and implement test cases and 
they do security coverage and, and look into it from a security perspective. And when they've ticked all the boxes, yes, it's in parity in Geth and Python, it has test cases with a happy path to the test cases, probably quirky edge cases. We've done the security review and yeah, found another five quirky edge cases, and that has of course as well. Uh, yada yada. Then they get back to the Alcorda and say, hey, we have checked all the boxes, when can we roll this out? And the Alcorda says, yeah, how about two months from now? Let's set fork number, blah blah. And that's when it's activated. Uh, <coughs> so it's not like we have a big hard fork coming, it's more like this EAP is now ready to just uh, be enabled. The work is done. More than that, in, like incremental stepping, uh, I, I want to give like a big shout out to Martin in the back because he uh, was the one asking for security considerations in the IPs. So that's a, a big, big, big step towards not letting these EIPs fuck up the network. And it's it, it's baffling how this is not done before, right? It's not like it's not requesting a lot of the first like if, if everybody's just reviewing these things after, as opposed to the one proposing them being aware of like how these things can affect the network. At least they can give some focus to, to the security uh, uh, guys, right? If you are the one proposing it, you should at least at least advise kind of trust model, say, oh, this is how this could affect the network. So yeah. It's not mayor's So so I think with twelve eighty three not mayor's Security considerations that makes, yeah. It's not merged. No. Okay, so we should merge that. <laughs> <laughs> well, with 1283, it was interesting because it's like a, um, it's a behavior from the gas stipend, which isn't easily found. You actually have to know um, the protocol quite well to understand what the side effect, what the security consideration is there, which an EIP editor might not even know. Like, the idea is fun and everything, but up until you know that uh, nice behavior of how the gas type it works, you can't provide any useful information. So, is there an effort, or should there be an effort where the protocol is documented better with all these like um, edge cases that got merged in previous EIPs that might affect other things, so that when someone wants to make an upgrade to the protocol, they can go there and see what they might interact with. And if not, is that something which we should ensure for ETH 2.0 that like really everything is properly documented? Because Google, Ethereum gas stipend, and you won't find anything. Um, yeah, uh, just to follow up on, on the last part of the question. So, I, when I first came into Ethereum, one of the things I liked the most, and I think a lot of people will actually disagree with me here, it was the yellow paper. So, people hate it typically. But coming out of the Bitcoin world where code was the documentation, this was fantastic. Like this was way better than than uh, was there before. And I find it a bit sad. Well, again, I understand it has been like I don't intend to blame anyone, but it uh, like it has fallen a little bit behind, right? So like not even the Constantinople opcodes are part of the current yellow paper. So. Um, like you don't have all the current opcodes in the yellow paper. Um, so that's of course not ideal. I mean, I guess I could also say it in another word, in another way, saying like a big shout out to like Yoichi and so on, who did a lot of the great work back then on the yellow paper. So unfortunately, we haven't been able to keep this up. And I think there we have to do a bit more again because that was, to me, I mean, a lot of people like to flame, but the, the, like, in the end, there's one place where you can go and you can check. Um, that has always been, been super helpful to me, so uh, I, I think that would be great. And um, yeah, so, and to quickly, to, to your previous question about the, the ERP and so on, yeah, it's, a, it's actually, a, it was mentioned before, it's a composability problem, right? Like, so because, like, you have these low level problems of, um, like, uh, gas costs and so on, and you have high level things like solidity, um, doing things a certain way and so on, and uh, um, transfers and, and so on, so these, when these come together, then there's these assumptions that don't really match anymore. And that's also yeah, what, what we saw now with this new hard fork, that there were some things being broken, where people made assumptions about gas costs being fixed, right, and now 
the cost of S load is going up, which is a good thing, but like still is breaking some some things that people were not expected to be broken ever and so on. So it, it's becoming more and more clear that actually there should be somehow more connection between low level and high level. It, at least there, there should be more discussion about it. It should still be clearly separated because developers don't want to think about it and they shouldn't have to too much, but there has to be somehow more um, interaction between these two worlds, I think. So composability is the problem. I guess that means Polkadot is going to have a lot of fun. <laughs> um, I think we're getting really close to an end here. Um, there, there's a question. Yeah, sure. Okay, microphone? Oh, over there. So I have two ready questions. So, so given that nobody can guarantee there is a bug free of the smart contract, so the first question is that, do you feel that you, uh, in Bitcoin, there's a time lock type of mechanism allow withdraw to hold in a certain period of time so you can crawl back. You think that's a good idea to handle withdrawal? That's the first question. Second question, since that we got ongoing audit and we try to anticipate some zero day or maybe responsible disclosure of any issues that you haven't seen it. So do you think it's a good idea to put some kind of like pure switch, either freeze the spawn or have a quickly move the bounce out? Um, with some higher privilege, like multi sig as a kind of good, best practice in, in terms of handle this kind of zero-day disclosure or, or kind of like a, you know, ongoing auditing findings that we don't anticipate. Uh, in the open sibling contracts, we have both the Tango contract and the also functionality, which are two. So yeah, I think both are good idea. <laughs> yeah, but, 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 but do you consider those are kind of like back doors? Because on the other hand, you can consider those are back doors. What we used to suggest is um, have those in there up until you can prove that your code is mature enough to then feel safe to turn it off. I think we're still so early in this um, space that we can't consider that a back door. So for instance, with what we did with Compound, so as we were talking before, is suggesting not, not only us, but uh, the community in general, uh, suggesting a, a time uh, log where you so if they want to upgrade the system or they want to make a major change, they would need to wait for some period. They introduce the, the, the change and then would have to wait for a period for the change to be implemented. So that people can, if they don't trust the, the change being implemented, withdraw their money. So that's a solution. And then, of course, there's governance. And there's many governance solutions. So they're from like a basic multisig to a DAO or whatever. So I think this is like a huge topic. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a very really valid concern. Um, another question? What advice would you give to someone who would one day love to do what you guys do, be a security auditor? D don't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's not that fun. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of responsibility, <laughs> none of the fame. Uh, <laughs> Get yeah, you just get blamed for shit. You get calls at two in the morning. <laughs> no, uh, I, I, like I hear that question a lot. Uh, there's, I, there's surprisingly, there's a lack of resources. Basically, I think the answer is, is that uh, there's a lack of resources for security in the Ethereum world still, um, even in the blockchain world, right? Uh, but, but specifically for Ethereum. I, we maintain the smart contract best practices repo, which is like, uh, it's basically a community effort by now. Like we still maintain it, but it's mostly crowdsourced. People just like keep, we just, we just merge changes um, and keep it updated. Uh, but it's it's the best one that I know of, and that's kind of kind of sad. <laughs> we have the Ethernet. Uh, a game where different levels where you hack your way up, launched that like two decades ago, and, and now it's like handled by the community in the same world, it's, and it's, it's super interesting, super fun to play, so that's a uh, piece of I definitely recommend. Learn the protocol, learn the EVM, learn how Solidity works, how the compiler works, and then start giving your friends free audits or code reviews. And at, slowly at one point they'll offer to pay you, that's how at least it works for me. There's yeah, there's a couple more CTFs that uh, there's um, 
there's a, oh man, I forgot the name of the uh, Capture the Ether, yeah, Capture the Ether by, by Steve Marks, which is really, really, really good and really fun. And there's a couple more that like have, uh, we've also been maintaining like a one alive from FECC uh, that I'm happy to share after this. Uh, so there's a couple of CDFs, yeah. Just a follow up, to what extent are some audits or the reports public? So I look at audits of previous projects as an educational tool, is that a thing? Uh, I've done that, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was going to recommend the open session audits. Um, yeah, I think everyone can learn a, a lot from those. Uh, any other questions? Uh, I have a question, a question about the processes, like uh, as Gonzalo was saying for zero x studies, when you deliver the report, there is like fixes that are coming up and you have to deal with it as a new audit. And you already have like new clients and new audits, so how would you juggle between those new audits and the previous, how would you juggle between those new audits and the new mitigation, new, new code, and also when is, when are you done with the code, when you say this is a good code? Don't take on too many clients. Is an easy one. But. Yeah. So, so we. Uh, so you're talking about like fixes to code we already audit, or like new rounds for all uh, clients. So both. Like when you we did the initial report, they, they come back with the fixes, and you have to look at the code again, and this goes back and forth. Like you could go yeah, forever. Yeah. And then yeah. So, so for that part, we, we plan ahead, so it's part of the service that we, we clients will come with like implementing the fixes we recommend and then we will we'll look uh, at it. So it's, it's part of the whole thing, so it's not like a different thing. Uh, and then for like new code of uh, old clients, it's, yeah, maybe we like try to prioritize them uh, if we work with them before. Uh, yeah, it's, it's planning, it's, it's very complex. <laughs> from, from like, yeah. Classical security. Uh, we would typically, I mean, in, in the follow up, you verify that the findings are fixed. And if they also redid the whole thing, it doesn't get a new audit. And they would have to buy a new audit. But this is like only a couple of tick the checkboxes, just these things that we found were fixed. But it's not like to the audit, you know, on the new code base. Yeah, just to follow that, so if there is a something found in that code later on. Is that your call, like the auditor's fault that didn't miss that? Or? Good question. So it's very important that you as an auditor to cover your own ass, write down exactly. We audited this hash of the code in the repository. The follow-up uh, was made on this hash and it specifically only covered checking that the previous findings were fixed. And you should put these kinds of text in to, to specifically say what you did and what you did not cover in the audit. Um, and if you don't do that, yes, you can get blamed later that, hey, these guys didn't see this. Um, whereas if you have it, you can say, yeah, but that was after this commit hash and blah, blah, blah. That, that actually happened, it's a fun story uh, with a classic security compa uh, company on SSH. They found a like, critical bug on SSH and they uh, reported it, it got fixed and then when they, they suggested a fix but they, they, that something else was implemented and they looked at it and valid and in the end there was a, like a, a vulnerability introduced by the fix that was not the one they recommended and they got blamed for years for introducing a backdoor in, in a very SSH so yeah, it's absolutely very powerful. But it might be a good tip to actually look at some classical uh, security reports, you know, standard security reports uh, and templates for that. And you will see that there's like five or six pages of just boilerplate text uh, saying like what the security audit has covers what it is and what it is not and blah 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 and like maybe two pages of actual content of findings and the rest is just don't blame us get a really good lawyer for the company <laughs> yeah. are there any other questions otherwise we're going to wrap this up because we've pretty much run out of time thanks guys